Let me tell you a story, a tale I once heard. Welcome, you are listening to Ladies Who Genre, a podcast book club for ladies and not ladies who like to genre now and then. I'm your host, Morgan. And I'm your other host, Noelle. This is not going to be a spoiler-free podcast, so if you've not read this episode's book or really the whole series and are sensitive to spoilers, then please pause the podcast now and come back after you've had a chance to read it. And there may be really, really big spoilers. There's a trigger warning for this guy. Um, There are a lot of battle scenes. (laughs) It's called Battleground, guys. There's actually quite a bit of cursing in peace talks um, and less so in Battleground. And that was actually very surprising to me because I am not sensitive to cursing in any way. In fact, I am basically a pirate. But even I was like, damn, dude, that's a lot of cursing. (laughs) (laughs) This week, we're discussing Peace Talks and Battleground by Jim Butcher. We are treating these two books as one because they were written as one and neither is really a complete story without the other. I don't know that I even necessarily realized that after having listened to the first book, which came out about maybe two months or so before the fir- next one. Yeah, one came right. out at the beginning of July and the other one came out in the end of September. Yeah, so I listened to the, the first one, Peace Talks, right when it came out. And I guess I could sense that like, hmm, a lot of things are talked about but not resolved. It wasn't until listening to Background that I realized that so many of full-on stories, uh, story types that Jim Butcher tends to do, the way he tends to format his books, while not necessarily completely formulaic, a little bit they are, (laughs) a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize how much these are one book that got split into two. I really felt like they were one book for sure, even when I read Peace Talks, because that ending, like I got an hour away from the ending and I was like, there is no way they are going to wrap this up in an hour. Oh, we are listening to these in audiobook just for anyone who doesn't already know that. So yeah, I was about an hour out and I was like, there's no way. And I'm like, damn it, another cliffhanger. And that's how I actually found out that they're, that it was written as one book, but it was, it was too epically long and he had to split it in order to make sure that like it could sell because I think they said it would have cost like $50 or something to buy the book because it would have been so massive. So he decided to make it to smaller books, which still ends up costing you $50 somehow if you buy it in hardback. So, (laughs) But I don't know, buying things in incremental units is maybe more affordable. Yeah, I felt like, uh, and I was like, you are so lucky that you, like not lucky, but smart to put it out right afterwards too, because I would have been mad if I had to wait years for that. There was one where um, like Molly gets snatched by Winter and that was a cliffhanger. And then there was like a giant gap in how long it was till the next book. And I was so pissed. <laughs> now, I, th- I am glad that if they had to split the books up, at least they did so in very short, you know, chronological timeline for us, us humans here in the real world. Also, Battlegrounds for me was friggin' exhausting. Like I was dying by the end of it. I I did power through the like last half of the book all basically in one day, but it is it is a grueling book for him. It takes place over one day. Like most of Peace Talks and all of Battlegrounds except the very end of it take place all in one day. And by the end of it, you are exhausted. So I'm actually really glad he split it into two books because I I, I needed a break. Like that would have been too much. I already feel like I don't want to move on to our next book. I ne- I'm, I've been listening to podcasts and stuff just to like palate cleanse because I just need to like calm down emotionally from that. <laughs> Which is fair. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I Maybe we'll talk about it more, but I guess I feel like it could have been one book and then just really more severely edited down. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I, I feel like that was possible. Okay. You know, but then again, I've listened to a lot of books that are, you know, 40 hours long to listen to, which, you know, most of Jim Butcher's books are like 10 to 15. Yeah. So I I can see how that's a lot if that's not the usual content the author brings. Yeah, I think I think it was two distinct stories. And I understand why they did a split where they did because one of them literally is an attempt at peace talks. And the other one is literally a battleground. So like, (laughs) I can understand why they would split it. But I can also see trying to make it into one book, but you'd have to take out so much of the content. And and there is a major character death in the second book, like a major character death. And so when that happens, like it needs its time, like you need to take some time with that. So I I'm I'm pro two book. Fair enough. Uh, The one thing that makes me laugh about this is that it's kind of its own spoiler the titles yeah peace talks 
But then Battleground, hmm, something tells me the peace talks didn't go very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he is going to write apparently 20 to 21 regular books and then do an epic battle trilogy. And so I kind of feel like Battleground, because it was just one book that is a giant battle, I do feel like it was a, a practice round for his epic trilogy because I've I, and man, that's going to be exhausting. And I hope he also releases those back to back because I don't know if I'm going to be able to like read that much into a giant trilogy battle and not have be able to access the next book. Although I, I am obviously, like I just said, totally exhausted by this one. <laughs> so who knows? I mean, but you'll probably have like five years to recover between yeah. this and the next. So eh. yeah. what do you think the final battle is going to be? Is it going to be the outer yeah. folks? I think so. Mm. Uh, and nemesis and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like the stuff that he's just been like sliding in for the last few books is Hinting gonna that. is gonna come full circle i think at the time and the nemesis being that walker that one walker but i don't think it's just the one walker i think it's probably all the walkers and and he starts the the book series by talking about a walker that he battled to get away from his mentor when he was a young kid and then he starts to realize like he didn't actually defeat the walker the walker let him go he realizes this at some point. So I feel like, yeah, he's going to go fight the walkers at the end. I mean, he scaled up this book hardcore. <laughs> the other books are kind of case files, I would say. Like something happens and he has to go fight something. And each time it does get a little bit bigger. But this is the first time that you're like, damn, <laughs> are you actually ready for this? And he's like, yeah, I got this. And you're like, okay, good luck. <laughs> All right. It, it, I feel like we really want to just dig into the book. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. why don't we talk about our pairings really quick? I decided that since this book is full of all the destruction and mayhem and shenanigans, particularly, well, let's just say, you know, demolition. I went with Elliot Bay Demolition Ale to <laughs> celebrate or commemorate the uh, destruction of Chicago in Battlegrounds. Yeah. And presumably the subsequent rebuilding. I don't know. I guess we'll see in future books. I started out wanting to go with something like a monster energy drink. And then I realized I don't want to drink a monster energy drink. <laughs> like, <laughs> because man, this thing was like uh, exhausting. And I felt like I needed a monster energy drink just to listen to the books. So, and I did listen to them back to back again. So that, that was another <laughs> probably part of this exhaustion. But I decided to go with a cup of coffee that is mostly sugar and milk. And for those of you who have read, battleground you will know exactly why i picked that but it would be it would be something you'd need you would need some protein a whole bunch of sugar and a little bit of coffee for staying up to do battle so cute okay but we'll get into that a little bit later i think so here's where we do the opening line of the book where i'm gonna read both of them because i feel like <laughs> they both give you a little insight into how the books are the opening line of peace talks is my brother ruined a perfectly good run by saying justine is pregnant and the opening line to Battleground is, apocalypses always kick off at the witching hour. It is it is interesting how much the book both relates and also doesn't relate, Peace Talks specifically, to the whole Justine being pregnant plot line. I mean, it talks about Thomas and the entire... I mean, peace, the Peace Talks have nothing to do with Thomas, and yet they do to some Yeah, extent. he's the background plot device that makes Harry and Lara, you know, up to shenanigans. Because otherwise yeah. they wouldn't be, right? They would right. be at the peace talks doing the political talk thing. And instead, they have to go do the side mission. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I can appreciate that. Oh, oh, the opening scene. Can we talk about the, like, starting stuff after he talks with Thomas during their beach run, whatever? The pancakes with his oh, yeah. double yeah. daughter. Yeah. Like his his intellectual skull daughter. Yep. And his flesh daughter. It's weird because they brought that skull Bonnie. So Bonnie is the result of the union of Harry Dresden's mind and the spirit of a fallen angel that was trapped in his head for, you know, less books than I remembered. Um, I just reread everything, obviously. And so I was like, oh, I thought she was in there a lot longer. It was only three or four books, actually. But yeah, when when Lashiel, Lash, as he calls her, sacrificed herself, it sort of Im impregnated Harry. And then Harry had to give birth in the, in the previous book to a spirit of intellect, which is very akin to his friend Bob, who is also a spirit of intellect. And Bonnie is a little girl spirit of intellect right now. 
Which is so cute. Oh, my God. Like, she... So, Bonnie and Maggie, which I love that his two daughters are Bonnie and Maggie. Yeah. It just the like almost rhyming. Yeah. So stinking cute. But they're trying to make pancakes and the spirit is full of the like, I know 200 recipes for pancakes. And it's just so stinking cute. I I appreciate that given how much they're not going to be able to devote a lot of time to Harry and his time as a parent for Maggie. I mean, in part because he didn't know that she existed for so long and they they kind of jump into this showing that there's probably some time between the books where he did get to spend time with his daughter. It's just so cute. I I appreciate the fluff. Yeah, I liked that fluff too. My my concern about it was they talk they bring up Bonnie and they talk about her and then she is nowhere to be seen for the rest of the two books and he's very concerned at all times about Maggie. Like she comes up constantly as a source of like not inspiration but like drive for his character to do what he's doing Mm -hmm. never once is bonnie mentioned and also like where is she yeah he had to flee with maggie from the place that he was at the time but there's no commentary about what happened to bonnie any to anywhere all the way through the rest of the two books so now i'm like uh where the heck is she what happened what happened there is did you did you remember that did you and yeah like they haven't even mentioned her in a kind of cursory here's where she's hanging out right like i gave her skull to so and so for safekeeping thing nope none of that and i'm like oh okay how how is that happening now i mean i just assume she's at michael's house but i yeah i mean i guess if we remember again that almost the entire two books are taking place over the course of practically a, a night like i I yeah. guess I can see yeah. how it makes sense that they wouldn't necessarily talk about her location during that time. Although it is weird just in a like parent thinking about his child sense. Yeah. That I yeah. don't think he feels that same parentage no. over Bonnie that he does over Maggie. And in some ways, he's even more of a parent to her than he is to Maggie because he didn't raise Maggie for the first six years of her life or what, eight years of her life, some some amount of years. But then he just stated that <laughs> bonnie like he's he's not only her dad he's her mom in some ways so yeah like it he she's she's literally part of him that that, that is fascinating to me i maybe she's still in the svartalv house that was or is belonging to uh molly but mm-hmm. who knows like i guess if it's only a day i guess he has to go nothing happened to that apartment so i don't know i don't know what the- yeah, I- presumably she's still hanging out there I- i'm sure it'll all get resolved yeah uh and that we'll see her again in the next book yeah and everything will be fine when she'll be a uh, but you're right it's weird that they- she's like the second chapter of the first book and then never again yeah i mean hmm. she's a great plot device they should have just like hang hang on to that thread but i there was a lot going on so yeah so i'm gonna let this slide this is I'm, I'm now past judgment. <laughs> that is fair. His his conjuritis. What do you think about this? So what I think about this is, <laughs> so it it's <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's silly. It's very funny. So what happens is you get this thing called conjuritis, and and essentially it's like allergies or whatever. You sneeze, and then whatever you are thinking about conjures out of nowhere, and. And happens to be there. So like if you were thinking about a baseball, a baseball would just drop out of the sky and it would last a few minutes and then it would go back to ectoplasm and and evaporate. But it seemed like kind of an awesome plot device because he used it to his advantage later. But it didn't, it wrecked his plans a lot in Peace Talks, but not in Battleground, which I was just like, okay. (laughs) But he used it, he used it as a really good weapon later, which was kind of cool. Yeah, I I can appreciate comedic relief yeah. sort yeah. of value that it had you needed it it it's very funny like very silly things happen because of it and also holy cow treacherous things happen like when they're actually down there trying to get thomas out of jail man <laughs> that totally feels like a harry potter style yeah uh, yeah childhood disease you it's know or like, not d- illness not disease you know what i mean it's like ron puking slugs for the next three days <laughs> yeah like it, yeah it feels very children's book-esque i guess yeah which is funny because it's nice we were just discussing how this is not a children's book (laughs) (laughs) yeah i did have a big frustration i guess with the the first book because they have never told ebenezer who is harry dresden's grandfather that harry dresden has a brother 
whose name is Thomas. Yeah. Oh and my he's god, a vampire. Uh, that thing, that thing that they do in shows and books and movies and everything, where a character has this problem and with another character, and everything would be solved if they spent five fucking minutes sitting down and talking to each other, but then they don't, and that's yeah. the story. That's yeah. the driving device behind the story. Or you have a piece of of information and you just like refuse for no good reason, zero reason, especially when it's like literally you're willing to like fight to the death to not tell this piece of information. And then literally as you're gasping your dying breath, which is like sort of literally what happened, you spit the information out. Are you kidding me? What? Like, why not just like, I know he's not going to be happy about it, but like it explains your behavior now and you don't have to go to war with him. Like, are you kidding me? Man, there's so many times where I wish I could go back in my own past life and be like, just talk about it. Yeah, that'll solve the problem. And Just I feel like it. that piece of advice <laughs> extends really well to a lot of books, shows, and movies I've seen. Yep. Just talk it out, guys. Yep. So so many things could be handled so quickly if you would just say what you think and say how you feel and risk the uncomfortable conversation you're going to have for one hour, and then it will be resolved yep. instead of basically dying. Except yeah, he didn't putting actually it die. off. Goodness, but eventually he does tell his his grandpa that. By the way, you've got another grandkid. Yeah, which is cool, and it <laughs> pissed pissed him off. He got so mad because it means his daughter basically was the lover of this vampire lord that he really really dislikes, and who actually ended up killing his daughter. So yeah. oh, didn't she die in childbirth? Yeah, I think I think they said that the story he got told was that it was death in childbirth, mm-hmm. but really that wasn't what actually happened. Okay, so, that sounds right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. we just we both spent the last like what two months? Yeah. <laughs> entirely rereading this whole series. Yeah. So, forgive me if some things are maybe a little bit blurry. Seven, 17 books now, is that right? 16? Yeah. Something? Yep, that's right. Some 17. Ridiculous amount of books now that we have we just powered through. And they do kind of blur together after a while. Yeah. Anyway, shall we go over the, like, okay, let's talk about what happened in Peace Talks. Sure. So his brother says that his girlfriend, who is a vanilla mortal human, is pregnant. And that shouldn't be the case. And his brother is moderately obsessed with this girl. He is actually a succubus-style vampire. And so it's unusual for him to have like actual love for someone Mm -hmm. he's used to like just feeding on them and he's almost killed her more than once so i feel like he's really stressed out about the fact that she might die (laughs) and because the the baby vampire is like essentially vamping on her while he's in utero or she's in utero yeah more than your usual sort of um belly parasite uh he's extra (laughs) extra extra drawing on the life preserves of the the human host yeah so there's apparently going to be peace talks between let's just call them the good and bad guys of the normal realm and the oh my god bad guys of the crazy realm that's just like the (laughs) easiest way to now we've made all the bad guys in the normal realm actually just into good guys like so everybody who was a bad guy before is now a good guy because we're all on the same team and we're fighting one common enemy. And there's going to be some peace talks to see if that's going to go down. And minutes after the peace talks went into effect, like it was the day of, Thomas was caught trying to assassinate the head of state for one of the, what are those called? The like, Svartov? The, yeah, but the peoples, like a, a group of people that are in this constituents uh nations people? yeah oh. yeah so like the head of state for one one nation of of supernatural folks was an attempted assassination and he did actually kill some high high ranking officials in order to to do this he failed and they caught him and they beat him almost to death but <laughs> in accordance with the accords they didn't kill him So Harry Dresden goes in, sees that his brother is captured, can't do anything about it because the peace accords are in effect. He is currently a member of the White Council, and he is also the Winter Knight. So he's representing two nations as high ranking member of those two nations. So he cannot just like get his brother out. So he's he's got a problem. So this is the entire entire setup for peace talks. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> so I, I have a, I have a question. Rage of dragons. You were so <laughs> upset that there weren't dragons. Are you upset that there aren't peace talks in peace talks? 
No, because I think there were peace talks. Like they attempted to, to, to have a peace talks and the person got there and they were like, let's have peace talks. And the person's like, nah, I fuck your shit up. And really? like, I interpreted it as like a multiple, multiple rounds of like reception. Do you want to read boring ass peace talk stuff? I like, suppose. I don't know. Maybe it happened. I don't know. It, it wasn't clear that any actual talks happened before the. No, they didn't. The- they just they attempted to have a peace talk, but the thing is, I want to read about dragons. Like I have a, a hard mm-hmm. a hard That's on. Fair. Let's just say hard on for dragons. <laughs> and I want I want dragons in my rage of dragons with dragons on the cover of the book. Yeah, I want that, but I don't actually I don't actually believe that any title of of Jim Bosher books is gonna like actually come to fruition. I was surprised that it was Battlegrounds that was actually actually he called it Battlegrounds. With two, there's only one battleground. Mm, yeah, Chicago. Yeah. The entirety yeah. of Chicago. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> also misnamed. <laughs> I was just curious. We we had that talk the other day, uh, and you mentioned the Rage of Dragons, and I went, hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. What do you think of Beast Dogs? But that's fair. What There's something about dragons. They're magical. They're cool. They're fun. You want to see them like making stuff happen in the story. Yeah. Whereas, I guess, Peace Talks in a fan- fantasy urban fantasy story Meh. <laughs> also skip this. also don't put like dragons on the cover of your book if you're not gonna have dragons all over the place that was that was lame not into it <laughs> <laughs> so after thomas tries to assassinate the the high official of the svartolf group what let's see i'm trying to remember what happened next there we have sex with carrie murphy which <laughs> hasn't happened yet so that was interesting <laughs> wait did it actually happen or did they just they just were starting to, but then the the other cops showed up. Is that what happened? No, no, no. I think it did 100% complete because the whole thing with Lara Wraith later on in Peace Talks where she can't like touch him safely yeah, because mm-hmm. he's recently had a engagement with someone that he truly loves. Yep. Is, is Karen in the very first book or did she not come until book two? No, she's in the very first book. Yeah. She's in the very first book? Yeah, she hand, she handcuffs him in it. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's fun to see characters that have been in all seventeen books so far, isn't it? Though, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it's sweet. They've been kind of doing this little dance of like, mm, I'm frustrated, but kind of like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they have come close, and then she's had good reason not to. Several. Is this like a honestly? It's a TV show. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. This would make such a good TV show. Like just becoming slightly more epic as time goes on i've been smashing through supernatural Uh and so part of me as i'm listening to this book over the past two months series of books excuse me the same sort of scaling happens yeah like hunt a monster of the week sort of thing Mm -hmm. until we reach like apocalypse level Mm -hmm. craziness have you watched the tv show because there was one I think so, because I have like this mental picture of the the main actor who did it. Paul Blackthorne. But it was it wasn't more than a few episodes, was it? It was an entire season. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I would say you should we should rewatch it because you'll get a kick out of it. Um, they turn Bob into a real person. Like he lives in the skull, but he pops out into a real person. And that's that, weird. Yeah, the character is actually kind of awesome. And Karen doesn't look anything like Karen should. And every time that I see her in something else, I'm like, you. Uh, but that is that man who plays Harry is who Harry is in my head now. So like forever and ever. The whole series, though, is one season, I think. And then it is one of the bo- it's the equivalent of one book. But I don't think the plot line follows the book at all. But mm-hmm. I mean, maybe a little bit. So it'd be cool if like the whole thing, though. Yeah. Was an yeah. Entire- yeah. Sure. Some of the first few books I feel like could translate into one or two episodes. Like the first few books are not super complicated, right? They're really introducing the world to us. Yeah. But as you get into later books, kind of like Peace Talks and uh, <laughs> Battlegrounds, that is the kind of thing that gets split up into a whole season of the craziness of all this stuff happening. Like, yeah. It would make such a good show. It would. It really would. Um, I think I think they said that it might be getting optioned again, actually. So maybe they will. I mean, that's completely possible. I did really like this book, Peace Talks in particular, for like the the level of setup that they did for Battlegrounds in Peace Talks was pretty epic. Like the whole thing with Butters um being a knight of the cross now and talking about his sword, so he has the sword of faith. Is that right? Um I think so. 
Yeah, and it uh, burst its mortal coil in the book before, um, but he still has it. And it now just won't harm anybody who's good. So you can swing it around all you want. And <laughs> that's pretty awesome because it sets him up for being a badass hero in the second book. Pretty hardcore. But also just has like fun moments like they're testing it. So he has to chop off Sonya's hand, who's another Knight of the Cross. And of course, it doesn't happen. But Sonya like psychs him out and is like, well, I guess I didn't need that hand anymore. And is like freaking out. And he's just messing with him. Nothing happened to him. So <laughs> I when I read that, I was like, oh, <gasps> and then I was like, uh huh. <laughs> yeah. I I really appreciate Sonya as a character. Yeah, yeah. He just I don't know. He makes me happy. So this is the my I think tenth time through this series, <laughs> and even still, there was stuff that I didn't catch before that I caught now that I'm like, oh, that's why that happened, and like I hadn't ever really realized it because you know when you're re-listening to a book series, especially me, I'm like sewing, I'm doing other stuff while that's happening. So like uh, you kind of zone out sometimes and you skip stuff and I might be skipping stuff, the same stuff every time or something. But like, yeah, I, I, man, I got a lot out of this reread actually, because I was trying to focus a little bit more um, to make sure that, you know, we're coming, we're coming up to the end. Right. I feel like the, there are so many things involved in these books that come back around later that you sort of dismiss because they seem like they're wrapped up but they don't like he is a spider weaving a lot of threads so i do i do really appreciate about that about him i do have a thing all of the things that i don't like about these books though are, are super technical things but the one thing that i hate about jim butcher's writing is that he uses the same phrases over and over and over and over and over again and if you are listening to all 17 books all at once you real start to notice that because like can any smile not be wolfish? Or how often does a dog really need to do a doggy grin? Yes. And can unseen force do anything but lash? It lash can't. out? <laughs> like, Clearly it can't. There are things in these books that I'm just like, dude, just find any other word. Get a thesaurus. Oh, uh, freaking. Yeah. yeah. Freaking came out a lot yeah. in this one. Yeah. Except, <laughs> except peace talks where he was fucking every time. And you were just like, Jim Butcher. What are you doing with your language? <laughs> There's usually like one or two swear drops in each book, but like Peace Talks was rabid with swearing. I was like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> How do you feel about the the thing that he does in pretty much every single book where he talks about, he reintroduces comment concepts to us, which I guess isn't unique to him. Like I feel like a lot of yeah. book series is, is. Yep. <laughs> will do this where every time he does a, a soul gaze, yeah. he kind of retells you what that means and how significant and unforgettable it is. Dude, we're and on book 17. Book yeah. 17. We don't need like if you were to, if you just showed up, figure it out. <laughs> I mean, I guess to some extent I tune it out at this point. Yeah. Like, it doesn't bother me in a way because I'm used to it. Yeah. And it just, whatever, it kind of blurs. It's kind of like those um, when you're watching a TV series and they do the on previously on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do a little preview of it. Like, I just watched the whole series. I don't need you to give me a preview. But <laughs> so I used to, I watched, used to watch, this is such a diatribe. I used to watch this show called Dark Shadows, right? And it's a television show that was put out onto the air live. It's a soap opera involving vampires. And I think uh, Tim Burton made a film of version mm. of Dark Shadows. It doesn't do the show justice, but the show is super cheesy. Like occasionally you see a boom mic drop in, people forget their lines. Like it's because it's a live soap opera that was put on in, I think the sixties man and it was like four years every single day they played this but the funny thing about it is at so they would have the end of the episode and then at the beginning of the next day they would react out the five minutes or so of the end of the last episode in case you like missed it and the thing about that is like a, it would not be the same every time. Like sometimes they would change the lines and you're just like, I guess they had Oops. a rewrite. <laughs> 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 Stuff like that. So anyway, this is this is very similar to me. It kind of makes me giggle. But yeah. Oh my God. Can you imagine live acting a show? Yeah. Every day for oh four years with is a vampire. Like <laughs> <laughs> you're just like, what? <laughs> what? Wow. I mean, good job. That sounds hard. Yeah, yeah. 
Some things I did really, really like about Peace Talks. Oh my God, we know more about Mac. So Mm. for people who don't know who Mac is, Mac runs a pub. And all you ever know about Mac is that he runs this pub, he makes great beer, he makes a great steak sandwich, and he doesn't talk at all. And that's it. That's all you know for for 16 books. <laughs> and, yep. then, and then you get to Peace Talks, and they tell you, and the whole time he's he's done one thing. I think he gave Harry a tip, like three or four books before that, about something like about the bad guys. He knew who they were. And Harry was like, how does Mac know who they are? And then sort of dropped that and then came back to it later and Mac was like, I'm out. And then they just dropped it. He didn't say anything, but you know something's up with Mac. And so in Peace Talks, you find out what Mac is. And I was like, what? I need more. I need to know more. I need to know everything. I need to know how this mechanic works. I need to know what. Because like what he is, is very significant. I don't know. I feel like they didn't say super strongly more than, I don't know. I feel like it's still hints. I feel like they're still saying, like, clearly he's not human. No. I mean, we just get that right out of the Harry blatantly says the the only thing he could possibly be is an angel, an ex-angel. What? Clearly, I need to re-listen. You need to re-listen. I don't remember him saying his angel. I remember him like uh, Harry wanted to look at him with his true sight. Mm-hmm. And Max said like, no, no, no. It'll like, hurt I you. don't want to hurt you. Yeah. I, but he's seen like Uriel. Yeah, but he didn't look at Uriel with his sight. Mm, okay. So Max saying no, because it will break your brain. And Harry literally says the words, the only way that this is happening is if he's an ex-angel. It could still be that Harry doesn't know And that's the only thing he could think. He's an ex-angel. So that's why I'm like, what is that mechanic like? How do you become an ex-angel? Like, can you? how do you fall without falling, right? What? What? Clearly, you're just like Castiel and you just want to hang out with the earthlings for a bit because they're cool. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's it. But like, (laughs) at the same time, you're like, but eh, you go... How do you, how he does, he, but he still retains divine powers. You know that because A, Harry's sight will break if he sees him, and, and B, he has the capacity to deal with some of the situations. So, mm-hmm. like, he has some of his divine powers left over. He didn't have, they do to- mention the fast healing earlier on. Yeah. And he's like epically, he's epically old. People who are super old remember him looking exactly the same in the book. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. And Mab is super, like, extra, extra respectful of him. Who's respectful to, like, who is Mab respectful to ever, right? Like, oh my god. Well, apparently Harry's dog. Yeah, well, his dog is also a guardian, and that... <laughs> 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 Harry's got a lot of, like, badass friends. Like, a lot of badass yep. friends. So, yeah. Um I I just like I'm so into Mac. Like literally, he could just be like, "Here's the story of Mac. The series is over," and I would be like, "Thank you. That's all I need to know." Like Harry's just gonna go mess some stuff up, and have to fix it in every book from now on. That's fine. I got it. I get what's going on. I don't really need to read all that, but I do need to read what the deal is with Mac. Like I need to know, and I need to know what his story is and how that happened. And was it for love? Like what is the situation? <laughs> There's also like more information and and uh, about Mab in this book, which I I found very interesting. Like she she says the words "I was mortal once," and she has said that before to him in another book. I do remember that, but like she said it in a very significant way, and she has like five or six moments in between these two books in which she is very much human at him. Like she, yeah, understanding and a reasonable, not like weird ice goddess. Yeah, at him. Yeah, and and that blows me away. Like I'm just like, what? What happened there? I want to know about the story between her and Merlin. Oh Doesn't my god! She yes. say something about like that he's like the reason that she became Mab or, or something like that. Something like that. Uh, well, no, it's the it's the god Ethniu. When she shows up, she says something to Mab, like I or King Corb does, like I remember when Merlin cast you out. Mm-hmm. I'm like, holy crap, is Mab Morgan? Oh yeah, maybe. Like that, because I mean that he, they talk about the King Arthur story, like the the sort of faith is supposed to be Excalibur, 
in reality. And so mm-hmm. they they talk about Merlin, like the not the Merlin, but the actual Merlin, as being Merlin from the Arthur story, and as if that story is fairly re- real and mm-hmm. whatever. So if Merlin cast her out, like I want to know about that, and like. What does that mean? Did he cast her out when she was human? Did he cast her out when she was a witch? Did she did he catch her cast her out when she was already like the was she ever she had to have been at some point the winter lady, right? She has not been the winter queen though the whole time. Right? I hadn't considered that, but yeah, it makes sense. I guess I like how do you become the winter mother? Like, does the winter mother have to die and then Mab gets upgraded and then the lady gets upgraded and then you gotta go pick a new lady? Like, this is all crazy. See, so they hint at that, right? They do hint that the progression is supposed to be lady to mother to crone. Right. Right. Yeah. But they also mention uh like some of the conversations that Harry has had with the crones. They've talked about how they have alternate names, yeah, like yeah, you know, the fates and yeah, like uh, various other like ancient, you know, crone style goddesses. Yeah. So I'm like, well, does it make sense that these goddesses were previously maiden and mother? I don't, I don't know. I can see it going either way. Yeah, they do uh, imply that the winter mother is Mab's mother for reals, like biologically, and that. Mab and Titania are actual sisters, and that Maeve was her actual daughter, and that Sarissa is her actual daughter, who is now the Summer Lady. Mm-hmm. So Titania lost her daughter, then lost Aurora, and then got Mab's daughter as her second. But I don't know that Sarissa gets treated like an a, 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 what is that a niece weird stepdaughter or something yeah like how does that yeah. like, i want to know how that works i want to know how all of them work and then and then molly shows up and she's not either but it does seem to imply that you do go up the chain because mab says if i die in battle today you need to kill molly because she's not ready oh that's right that's right yes and, oh my and goodness she would become the queen and knowing what mab has to do like mab's job is not to just be the winter queen Titania's there as the summer queen to check Mab's power against humans, but Mab's power is to hold the gates against the outsiders, like Cthulhu level outsiders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so she's she's doing battle constantly. Like this battle that's happening here is kind of like NBD to her, except it's not because she says she could die. I guess she doesn't necessarily isn't the one that actually gets involved each time at the, at the outer gates, and that's just happening constantly. Yeah. So I just the whole thing is crazy. Like I am so fascinated by how all of this works and I hope that they explain the entire mechanic of it, but they also might not. And that makes me crazy. I, I'm sure it'll get discussed at least a little bit more. If for some reason, if for some crazy shenanigan reason, the series ends without it being discussed more fully, I feel like Jim Butcher will be pretty happy in interviews at that point to be like, Hey, here's what's up. Yeah, although you he, know he's a bitch of an interviewee. Have you watched his <laughs> interviews? No, I'm he's, not. He's resistant to being interviewed. Like the stuff he says isn't. He's pretty snarky, and he doesn't drop a lot. And when he does, it's not in the format that you would like. I do think that there's absolutely no way he's gonna stop after that. Like he's gonna write additional books or do a series spinoff with like somebody else or whatever. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I guess even if your main character dies, there's a, there's a whole rich, you know, world of side characters like Mac. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, you know, interesting subsequent books could totally be made off of. So, yeah. Th- I mean, that's kind of the nice thing. If you create an interesting enough world, you can just keep going. Yeah. You can write side stories, you can write short story omnibuses, all that kind of stuff. Should we talk about Battleground? Sure. So, I mean, Battleground begins where Peace Talks left off. Which is... With, oh, go ahead. <laughs> with our, our big uh, Titan friend F- coming you. into the Peace Talks and just f- fucking shit up. Yep. <laughs> before deciding, like, hey, war on all y'all. War on your cow. War on your mother. War on everything to do with you. She's so angry. Yeah, they, they attempt to have the Peace Talks and... Uh, uh, a goddess rolls in and basically just says F this party and then sets off like 
uh which is an, like essentially a neutron bomb in <laughs> like because it mm-hmm. yeah like in chicago it just like it messes up well no it's not a neutron bomb it's like a emp bomb it like yeah, knocks yeah, yeah. out all the power all the power goes out yeah so the, everything everything's dead uh not mm-hmm. not humans or people it's just all the power's out like that you have no communication you have no nothing and then says for some reason i don't know what time it is but she's like i'm gonna come back at the witching hour and you're like but why Why? just do it now (laughs) (laughs) but anyway she gives them time to regroup so so thank you plot plot device yeah they do mention that later on they're like you didn't have to yeah yeah like wait he calls it out (laughs) you could have just freaking started yeah you could (laughs) what what are you doing you're bad at this man (laughs) (laughs) so um yeah in the first like two or three chapters there's a freaking kraken fight i was just like what in uh, Lake Michigan, right? Is there really a Kraken fight? There's a Kraken it, fight. Krakens live in Lake Michigan. It's yeah. canon fact now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Harry's for some reason on a boat. Oh, he had to go back to his island. He had to drop off Thomas. So the, so so him and Lara, in fact, did rescue Thomas in the book before. Spoilers. Um, got, they had to drop him <laughs> off. You don't get to talk about Paddleground without that. So <laughs> they drop him off on the island. He gets put in prison. That's the only way to keep him alive. Um, so... He's on the he's on the water coming back from that to try to save the entire city because, you know, he's got 50 things to do like he always does. Um, and uh, a Kraken attacks him. <laughs> and I just sat there going like, wow, chapter two and we're in a Kraken fight. Like, yeah, not messing around here. <laughs> Getting stuff done. <laughs> Getting it done. <laughs> oh, oh d- d- he soul gazes the Kraken. Oh, yeah. That That's was crazy. First, like, Let me tell you about a soul gaze. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> conversation we have in that book Uh. (laughs) you're just like what and they they also keep talking in this book and the one before it about him being starborn and it says like once every 666 years like can we really really anyway a person is born on this one day or any kid born on that one day is called yeah i think it's not just one person i think it's anybody born on that date yeah and you find out other people that you know in this book are starborn so like listens to wind is a starborn mm-hmm. yeah um the merlin was maybe a starborn i think i feel like two people i can't remember who the other one is yeah someone else was starborn and you're just like wait what what does this even mean and they talk about it all the time and in fact at some point harry's like ready to just be like i'm not saving this damn city unless somebody tells me what starborn <laughs> means and they're like nah no. we're not gonna tell you we'll tell you later if get through this tonight and we'll tell you later and then the end of the book comes and they do not tell you. And you're like, literally, you said, if I got through this night, you would tell me. <laughs> well, I mean, but the uh, it's fine. It's fine. No, no, it's not fine. They had three <laughs> hours of content. <laughs> three hours of content after the fight was over. So this book is like 16 hours long. Battleground is. I got to hour 13. Battleground. The, the battle is over. Everybody's fine. Blah, blah. Not everybody's fine. Like, lots of people didn't die. But... They had three hours in which they could have discussed Starborn. They did not discuss. I'm mad. I'm 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 drawing a line in the sand, and I'm saying I'm mad. I suppose that's fair. <laughs> I guess I I found all the repeated, you know, little hints very similar to what we've seen in past books. The whole concept of like Starborn has been slightly introduced over the the past few books, as well as the um, what is it the stars and stones um, empty night like all of these like little curses that uh ebenezer uses and ebenezer's like don't say that because you don't know what that means yeah which is funny like don't tell a kid not to say fuck yeah yeah if you (laughs) i told you that my second word was uck right very nice i did not know that it was uck but i like it yeah because my dad swore all the time and also my first word was coca because he would put (laughs) coca-cola in my bottle cute all right (laughs) so hope i'm sure that'll come up in the next couple books i'm not that stressed about it yes it would have been very nice to know now what the heck was going on but i recognize that like it's a draw in to keep us interested yeah for the the next book it'll be fine it'll be talked about yeah i can be patient i guess maybe yeah um the the heavy hitter in this book is that a major character dies like a major character dies and i mean this is not a spoiler free podcast you can just say who well maybe they don't want to know okay um 
(laughs) (laughs) So the night before I was writing in a book because I'm trying to practice my penmanship because pandemic and we're all trying to improve our BS or whatever. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Everything about our lives and we're stuck in a house. Okay. So I wrote literally the words, I wonder who's going to die. Is it going to be Ebenezer or Karen? And it was Karen. And I was like, Ebenezer's still good in a fight, so they kind of need him. But like, there are people in these books that at this point, their story is over. Like, Michael's story is over. Like, he could die. That would suck. Yeah. Everybody would flip a table. That wouldn't be okay, but he could die. And Karen's story was over. She has been so badly injured in the book previous to Peace Talks, I think, that there was no coming back from that. Like, she was going to be... It was really funny, though, because I listened to those back to back also. And they said... At the end of that book, they said, oh, she might get back to about 90% of what she was before. And then they start peace talks by saying, nah, she's going to be lucky if it's 50%. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess that's a thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, so she she gets killed and she gets killed um, in a stupid, stupid way that will just make you crazy. And Harry loses his mind. <laughs> like, absolutely loses his mind which is to be expected and it sort of uh gives him fuel for the rest of the battle i would say but yeah it it was pretty gruesome like i was crying it was not good i cried four times during this book it was (laughs) was crazy so yeah that that death is pretty gnarly yeah like speaking of the whole like characters that are kind of done like michael carpenter whenever they had that that sort of flashback memory whatever you want to call it scene that showed the uh like fighters breaking into the carpenter's household and just killing everyone Mm -hmm. i completely believed it was a thing yeah like i like because and i think that maybe part of that is because i agree with you michael carpenter feels done yeah and uh like they've they've said his character is retired he's chilling yeah (laughs) um but they could have totally assassinated his character out of the story and it would have been absolutely a such a gut punch Mm -hmm. right especially if it's not just him but his entire family all of marring of course marley yeah molly sorry because she's battling i guess um but like and to have Maggie killed off after we got like the sweet little pancake scene with her at the very beginning of Peace Talks, I could totally believe it. And I was like, oh no, this I, is literally the worst. I believed it and I thought it was the best. I was like, yes, because this makes nightmare fuel because it would it would warp Harry to no end and it would take Molly with him. Like they would both go absolutely insane and he would have to spend the next three or four books writing them back to something that could be like it would be crazy like that would be absolutely the most epic plot twist and i would have like given jim butcher all the high fives like i am the person who also watched um the avengers movie that wasn't endgame the one before it and i didn't know there was a second last avengers movie age of ultron no yeah no no, it was what you mean yeah anyway so i watched it and it and half the people died and then they faded to black and i was like holy crap that was awesome because like nobody ever does that like it's it's always some like bs we're gonna fix everything don't worry about it and you don't have any actual consequences like that stuff makes me crazy so i was actually pumped when they killed michael and the whole family because i was just like yes this is gonna make both of them go absolutely apeshit like this is gonna be fantastic and it didn't happen now i didn't love it but i also still i still instantly felt oh my god this this has such ramifications and it is totally believable i didn't once during that scene go what no I think I'm gonna get hate, <laughs> you know I, mean? I think I'm gonna get hate DMs for all the things I just said. <laughs> People are gonna go like, "You wanted Spider-Man dead." <laughs> well, but there's something to be said for ending a story and ending it in such a like earth-shattering way. Yep. What was that one? Um, I'm so bad at uh, Rogue. Rogue One. Oh yeah, yeah. The Star yeah. Wars movie where yeah. like just they just kill off all the characters. Yes. That was amazing. Speaking of which, Star Wars spoilers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. That was the best part of Rogue One. Yeah. Just committed. Like, there's something really powerful about that. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody expected them like, no, they'll come back. They'll come. There'll be another one where they just something. Ha-. No, I'm like, no, kill them. Just kill them all. It's great. 
<laughs> that said, even though they didn't end up killing the Carpenter family, I appreciate the way that he f- figured out like instantly that it was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like because the dog there was there. something yeah. powerful about that. Yeah, but like and then like no 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 no. I see the the flaw, and he he says that like that must have been put there for him to see. Yeah, which is Absolutely. I don't know. I appreciate. Yeah, do like. <laughs> the, he calls himself on his own stuff sometimes, which I actually really appreciate. You know, like, hey, why didn't you just start? Like, why did you give us till the witching hour? That was dumb. You know, <laughs> like, why did you give us time to like amass the troops? Like, just take over if you want to take over. You know, yeah. Like he calls it out, and I I totally appreciate that about his writing style, which is funny. Yeah, I think the only things I problems I had really with these books are technical. I I had like really small things. Uh, James Marsters, he reads these books, is like uh, I love him so much, but man. He changed two characters' voices, at least, in this, and it made me crazy. Like, absolutely nuts. He changed Mab from being, like, super sultry and sexy to, like, growly and gross. And I was like, what even is that? She sounds like her mom. And then she he changed River Shoulders, like, halfway through a book. Like, he talked differently. And I'm like, did you not? What? Like, just go listen to your last book. Why are you giggling at me, Morgan? <laughs> Because I'm going off about stuff. <laughs> no, that's fine. I appreciate every time you go off about things. Okay. It's my favorite. <laughs> um, also, like, the other thing that bothered me a lot, and it was mostly in peace talks. It happened one time in Battleground, but not too bad. And I, it was, like, it's kind of an editing problem. And I, I actually know that the editor of peace talks watches my vlogs, which I think is funny, or possibly listens to this podcast, too. Um so I don't actually think it was an editing problem. I think it was the guy who recorded the, you know, like when you you do a voiceover and then you have to go like re-record some sections. Mm-hmm. The re-record inserts are really chunky, like the volume yeah. changes and the like weight. And it's James Marsters' fault too, because he he changes like sometimes when you're talking all NPR and then you go to like this. When you do your re, re-, re- it's bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so like it's not it's not an editing problem, really. It's the person who was rereading it. It's a recording problem. Yeah. It didn't Yeah. It was real chunky in Peace Talks. And I was like, ugh, every time it happened. And I I yeah. have, like I said, listened to all of them recently and I didn't notice that anywhere else. I for sure noticed it in Peace Talks. Like, yeah. I don't know that I heard it or caught it in in Battlegrounds, but in Peace Talks it happened like two three times enough for me to go really yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like i i'm not imagining it this must be a thing yeah but other than that but, like yeah. i thought they were great like everything about them i thought was pretty good you know like uh i can bitch about parts of a story but i also really feel like it's jim butcher's story to write and he should write the story he wants not the story that i would have preferred if such and such had happened or whatever just like i am i'm here for this story so yeah yeah no there's there's something so nice about enjoying enjoying the story as the author has written i am very very rarely someone who reads a story watches a series whatever and goes nope that's not the way that should have been yeah like i can recognize that i may be sad that the main character's didn't get together till the very end and then they die but you know let's uh (laughs) star wars let's just pretend that you know it's not the story that was meant to be told and that's okay yeah uh i i can appreciate that this isn't my story to tell and what it is is somebody else's and that's just what's gonna be yeah uh but yeah i i have a strong forgiveness level when it comes to, well, but that's out of character for that character. I'm like, well, clearly it's not out of character because mm-hmm. the character did it. Yep. <laughs> like, you know, maybe there's just hidden motivations that you don't know yet as a reader and like things like that. Yeah. People got real salty about Game of Thrones at the end. And I was like, shut up. Do better. Yeah. If you it want is it, the story, whatever. You should have made this. Shut up. It is what it or is. Or go, go write fan fiction. Yeah. And uh, make yourself feel better. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the very end of Battlegrounds had so much in the last like chapter or two just smushed in uh, for the story. Oh my goodness. So the whole book, nothing but battle, 
battle, battle, battle, battle, battle, battle. Karen and dies. And at the very end. And then there's more battle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and at the very end is kind of like resolution, wrap up. Like, how do we, how do we figure out this battle stuff? Consequences, right? Yep. yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's so many things I appreciate. I, I love that Harry's getting back his old house. Well, sort of. He's getting a sort castle. Of. Like, yeah. When he said he wanted his basement back, that's that's the exact words he uses. I says he said, "I want my basement back." I expected John to move the entire castle. Like, I he, kind he, of. he had the yeah. whole castle moved there, so I expected him to move the entire castle somewhere else because it has all that crazy spell work on it, right? Who yeah. wants to give that up? And also, it seems like a pretty fat pad. So I was like. I'd want to keep that. So I would have been like, there's your basement. There's a hole in the ground. Enjoy. Enjoy. But he First. didn't. He gave him the keys to the castle. And you're just like, uh, okay. Yeah, it's a little bit surprising. But how badass is that to have your own castle? Yeah, yeah. That's so... <laughs> and I love that he was like, there's a giant hole because it got bombed. He's like, can we do some sort of Doctor Strange situation up there? And I was like, that's awesome. There was another thing that they did in this. Oh, he acknowledged you're a wizard, Harry. Which yeah, I was just yeah. like, yes, he finally made the joke. Oh, goodness. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, so once he has the, the keys to the castle <laughs> uh, and he has, what is it? It's Lara, Mab, and Molly. Molly are there. All all together. Which he should feel real nervous about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because those, those are some ladies that are up to shenanigans at all times. The third favor for Lara. Yep. Oh my goodness. That has so much potential <laughs> also because we all know that like the reason Karen got knocked off is to pave the way for the Winter Knight and the Winter Lady to finally have a thing, right? Well, they can't cuz Winter Lady cannot have sex. No, only Mab can't. Maeve was having sex with everybody and their mother, if you recall. Mm, okay, I might be misinterpreting. Maybe it's not sex she cannot love. She can't. No, well, I don't know about that. But Molly. So still did you was. read? Did you read the story with uh, Molly and uh, Ramirez? No. What are you talking about? There's a short. Okay, so there's a short story in one of the like collection of short stories. Then I probably read it. Yeah. Okay. That where uh, Molly and Ramirez. It's one of Molly's first missions that she is doing as the Winter Lady. Okay. Where she has to go figure out why this group of people in like uh, Alaska or some other really cold northern place why this group of uh supernatural people are not still paying their like yearly tithe oh yeah I do remember that yeah mm -hmm. and so she and Ramirez like hit it off mm -hmm. roll into each other yeah and you know near the end they tr attempt to get together like the super lustful because they're both like what in their 20s yep like <laughs> young 20s getting real excited and into it hot and heavy and then like she like goes blank and wakes up realizing that she's like broken all of his bones and shit oh uh and mab explains that like you are the winter lady mm -hmm. you need to stay the maiden of the maiden mother crone huh dynamic so but that which, doesn't make any sense because Maeve was like literally humping anything that moved but did she have sex with them after she humped them i don't know like maybe, I, she, maybe she was breaking bones maybe she was doing that and that was still fine with her like she was kind of evil so maybe they i mean so they, they mab made it sound like the act was not consummated because that would break the mantle of the Winter Lady. Oh. Like, that was not allowed. I, I, I could be misremembering, as we've already established. I do kind of blank out a little bit as I'm reading. Is that the one that you like? Okay, so Morgan had this thing where she went on to the next book, but it wasn't the next book. It was a short story omnibus. And I was like, <sighs> dude, that's not the next book. What are you doing? And she was like, oh, man. So is that the, was that in that one? Yeah, it okay. was in that one. Okay, I'll go read that one again, because I didn't. I only read straight down the thing. Have you read the so, Big, Bigfoot Tales or whatever? The one with all I of I did not, no. You should get that one. It's really good. <laughs> it's all of the stories about Harry working with Bigfoot. Which I've been wondering. I was like, it feels like they just 
suddenly he knows this bo- Bigfoot character. He does. Really <laughs> and well. they like d- to cover it. Well, that's, apparently it was in a short story. So I, I will have to go back. It's actually like four or five short stories. Uh, it's this it's same same concept where it's like, I think the book is called Working for Bigfoot or something like that. And it's got a bunch of short stories and they're all about him doing jobs for Bigfoot. Cute. Yeah. Well, I will I will go back and re-listen to those at some point. But that's that's why I don't be- I never had an assumption that he and Molly would actually get together, despite like a little bit of kind of flirtation in that direction. Well, I mean, she said she offered sex to him at the beginning of the book before, and she was still the winter lady at that point. And she said to him, like, well, because he said, if it, if it ever happens, it won't be like that. And she goes, well, what if it's offered? Yeah, so- but I don't know that this this mission that she went on wasn't necessarily her literal first, but it was early on. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying this happened just right after, right before this book. When mm-hmm. when he sh- when she shows him her apartment, this faltar of salt, I can't use the word. <laughs> <laughs> when he shows her, when she shows him her apartment, they're leaving in the monster mobile, and she tries to get him to have sex with her, like or at least like, you know, start up a relationship. Or but it was really an offer of sex, um, because she could feel the mantle in him wanting sex, and she goes, he goes, it won't be like that, and she goes, well, what if it's offered? So that makes me think that he she can have sex with the knight maybe and maybe that's the distinction i'm not yeah. sure because there was that whole subplot of the the knight like sexually assaulting yeah the previous summer lady which yep. made me wonder like wait a second yeah so maybe i need to spend some time <laughs> looking this over to figure out what exactly the rules are here because that short story made it seem like Molly could not do the thing. And every time that they, and also, so when, when this happens, the thing that we're actually ever going to talk about um, happens, <laughs> Molly's pissed. She's mad. She, she's, she's jealous and she wants it. And to everything that they had said in the several books working up to it was basically the knight and the lady are meant to be together. <sighs> so that's, that's why I think like the whole Murphy getting killed off thing is, designed is set up to allow them a clear path and then this thing is throwing a wrench in that clear path because mab tells harry he has to marry lara wraith i mean if you gotta be married to someone but she can't have sex with him either because he had sex with with murphy yeah but uh they that whole like love protection thing only lasts so long so if he does start to genuinely fall in love with Lara, which is exactly, I'm not saying it'll happen. I'm just saying. I'm giving mm-hmm. Morgan the look of no. <laughs> no. No. Like, that's the whole idea behind this whole, like, one more year before they actually have to get married thing. So he to didn't have is- sex with, with anybody for, like, four years after the mom of... Uh, Sarah. No. No. Gosh, who am I thinking of? That lady he killed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. For some reason, I thought her name was Sarah. Um, well, no, it's fine. Doesn't matter. With when, when he had sex with Maggie's mom, that love lasted protection on him for more than four years. That that is fair. That does sound right. So I don't know. Like, is it in? He'd have he'd have to fall in love with someone in order for it to go away, and that might not happen. Also. I mean, it is good in in some ways because she's at least gorgeous and she's smart and she's powerful and all those things. But I don't think he he doesn't trust her at all. And I that seems also weird because his brother is also her brother. And (laughs) he has no relation to her. He doesn't. But man, it'd be better if it was Molly. I'm I'm I ship Molly. That is fair. (laughs) It is fair to have favorite ship fun like. also he just doesn't trust her he he doesn't trust her at all and i don't think he's ever gonna love her so it would be a weird marriage and if i were him i would make sure that i never fell in love with anyone ever again so that i could make sure she couldn't fucking touch me because <laughs> she's dangerous af and she's proven that time and time again and she doesn't like, she takes care of family, so that's kind of cool. But I feel like she doesn't consider Harry family, but she kind of considers him... She, s- she considers him step family yeah. to some extent. You I know. feel like Harry's strong 
strong uh, association and desire for family and what that means to a person and what it means to him. I, I feel like he appreciates that so much that he recognizes it in Laura and how yeah. much she treats her family as best as she can, barring her father, which is a whole different situation, which, you know, is from yeah. another book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I could, I mean, the same way that he kind of was really starting to appreciate Lashiel. Yeah. Um, especially after having been with her for a while and recognizing slow changes within her. Yeah. I bet you if Lara started demonstrating changes based on their interactions with each other over the course of a year, totally wouldn't surprise me if they told yeah. us. Yeah. But, but that's for the next book. So eh. but speaking of changes, holy crap, Molly. Like, <laughs> like she was off building an army. Everyone says she's good at her job. Like, but remember, she was also pretty close to off the deep end for a very long time. Like very at the very beginning of her arc, like when he finds her, she's almost off the deep end. Mm -hmm. When he dies, she's off the deep end. Like there's a lot of Molly being off the deep end that happens in these books. And then Mab says, if I die, you have to kill her. Like, holy crap, Molly. Like, so that leads us to like the possibility that at some point she could take Mab's job. Like she won't be the winter lady forever, even though yeah. to us it seems like forever because it seems like Mab's been the queen for thousands of years. But that also makes me wonder like when the winter mother was the winter queen. Queen. Yeah. Uh, mother. When I guess when the winter mother was the winter or when the, yeah, when the winter mother was the winter queen, cause it's lady queen mother. Well, but they're all Queens and no, but they're called lady queen mother. Sure. Like Mab is the queen of air and darkness and whatever. So, mm -hmm. so when the winter mother was in Mab's position, who was she queening over? Like were human beings like Neanderthals at the time? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it seems like all, well, I guess maybe not. Maybe what is the Arthur story? Is that, because yeah arthur story is like after the whole like greek roman empire situation For 1400s is that what people think arthur was when it was 1400s does that sound right don't ask me okay. i'm gonna get this wrong there, people have like specific numbers for the arthur but story. medieval yeah Let, let's go yeah. with that arthur is medieval yeah whereas and, and if that is where Mab started, which we kind of maybe have a subtle hint that that's the case, then she's actually only been queen for like a thousand years. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But also, it doesn't say that Merlin cast her out and she wasn't queen already. It's true. We don't so, we don't know that. But she does say I was human once, which me which implies that human beings existed. So, so there's at least that. So, yeah. Like, how long is your tenure? How old is the winter? I'm, I'm back on the queens and I want to know more about them. I clearly think that's what's <laughs> happening here. But yeah, like, man, she, Molly has changed a lot. Yeah. And so at the end of this, this book actually, okay, I don't actually know if this happens in the book format, though, because in the audio book, at least, we know that you read this entire book and then there's still like an hour left and you're like, wait, what? And it turns out that they added on an additional story, and it's a Christmas story. Which is so cute. Which is I, so cute. I appreciate that they started Peace Talks with a super kind of cute, heartwarming, well, the second chapter, but whatever. Yeah. They started off with a cute, sweet, like, family-oriented little thing, and then they ended it with yeah. a cute, sweet little family thing, which, which is nice. Especially yeah. after, like, it, like, so much battle, so much, like character death and being sad and like the end of the battle they have this whole memorial like burying all the pictures of people who died in the battle yeah in Harry's grave which is uh yeah like I legit cried I uh I was very sad so I I can really appreciate ending the audiobook with a cute little Christmas story to kind of yeah. bring your spirits back up yeah yeah, that was it was a great, great little add on. Um, I I liked that he meet his kid gets to meet Chris Kringle because you see him so much in these stories. Also, like, what is up with that? OK, so we have Odin, the Allfather, one eye, who's also Vaterung, 
mm-hmm. who's also Chris Kringle. And I yep. think and think they said he was one other person in this book also. But I don't remember who it was. It wasn't as impressive as like Santa Claus. But they did say he had one other name and that's who he was in that that period. That was amazing. Oh, if we want to talk about changes. John Marcone. Who did oh. not see that coming? <laughs> so uh, it's so true. this whole battle. Okay, so Karen dies, right? You're like, oh god, Karen dies. Ah, uh. and then and then there's like six hours, literally six hours of just fucking fighting, just just fighting, 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 fighting for like ever, and it's just and descriptive battle sequences where you get to know where everybody is and what's happening, and every big name that you've ever heard of is down on the ground, almost dead. Weirdly, no one actually dies, <laughs> except John Marcone. Oh, Hendrix dies. Oh yeah, yeah. that actually made me sad because like yeah. Harry's had like a a a, a funny Frenemies. yeah funny little thing with him for the whole time, and I was like, oh man, that sucks. Like it wasn't it wasn't Murphy level sucks, but it was kind of bad, and and also Guard like really was into him. Um, but so John Marcone dies, and then he doesn't. Oh my god. Oh my god, he took a coin of the fallen. I mean, I totally saw that coming. Although at some point, Harry in the previous book, Harry and Nicodemus had had a discussion and he said, like, Nicodemus was like, I'm surprised he didn't take the coin. And Harry was like, I'm not surprised. John Marcone doesn't work for anybody, blah, blah, blah. And in this case, he has Thorn and Namshill and he doesn't work for him. Like, I mean, in the same way that Nicodemus is, yeah, he is still the person, Nicodemus, yeah. not the the angel that is stuck in the coin. Yeah, like because they talk about how like sometimes the angel just immediately overpowers the person. Yeah, I also thought it was very interesting. John didn't take the co- coin inside of him. Everybody else has the coin inside of them. Like it's in their palm, it's in the center of their forehead, it somehow pops out of them when they decide to release the coin. Mm -hmm. John does not have that happening. John has it on a necklace around his neck, which means A, it's grabbable, and two, he didn't actually take it inside of him. And I am fascinated by this and how this mechanic works. And like, how do you, how does, how does that work? How, if you're not taking it inside of you, how do you have the eyeballs inside of you? Like, what is the situation with that? Thorn and Namshiel until now seemed like just a giant thug who didn't really think and who was just like fighting McFight pants. But like, he seems real smart. I mean, he was a sorcerer, but he also seems super thuggy. But he seems really like genteel and he has a British accent and stuff. And I'm like, how does an, a fallen angel get a British accent? Like, Britain didn't exist when the... Okay, never mind. Yeah, don't. <laughs> don't think about it any further. <laughs> yeah, so so anyway, I have this this book, these two books, whatever. So many questions. Like, I... That's actually great. Like, I, I feel like that's great. But there's just, like, I have so much stuff I need to know now. And I am upset that there are three or four regular books left. And then... One, because they're going to be case files, right? So like some monster of the week crap's going to happen, um, and then a, a triple down. But like, man, how are you going to tell me all the stuff I need to know? Like, I need to, I need to know that. Like, I want to. Well, they're going to keep doing the thing where they hit, reveal like one little tidbit about each of the various characters throughout each book. I know. <laughs> Do not want. Uh, I I enjoy the journey. I want standalone novels on each one, and I want their history. Give me all the information in Wikipedia right now. I just had this diatribe about how I said it's that man's book to write and it's not my business to be telling him how to do it. And I'm like, bitch, give me the info. Yeah, you can still (laughs) want what you want, but also recognize that it's not someone else's job to give it to you. He's not your bitch, (laughs) as they said about (laughs) George R.R. Martin. Have you seen that? I have not, but that, that I don't feel like I need to see it. This sounds like a thing that I feel in my heart. Yeah. So I was at I was at this thing called Wootstock, which is like a bunch of it's a, a nerd showcase that happens at Comic Con and a few other places. Anyway, at one point, um, George R. R. Martin is there, and these guys, Paul and Storm, write this song that's called "George R. R. Martin, Please Write Like the Wind" because everybody wants him to write faster or whatever. And then Neil Gaiman walks out, and he just looks at a piece of paper and then looks at the audience and just says, "George R. R. Martin is not your bitch." And then leaves like (laughs) it was amazing. So and George R. R. Martin's like there. So it was all very funny. Very fun. Yeah. I 
That sounds like it's worth seeing. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's on YouTube. Yeah. I'll find it. For sure. That'll be good. So, okay. The whole story of the entire peace talks, battlegrounds, the, you know, these two books started out with Justine is pregnant. Yep. And it's not until the very, very, very end yep. of Plot twist. Battlegrounds that they're like, surprise, it was Justine the whole time. So at the beginning, he goes to see Thomas and Thomas says, it's Justine. Or he can't even talk. He just says, it. Yeah, he kind of mumbles Justine. Yeah. And so uh, Harry Jesden has this bad habit of realizing things when he's passed out. Like whenever he gets knocked out. And it, in the past, it has been he's had a discussion with his own alter ego. And this time it didn't happen. He just somehow, while he was passed out on a boat sleeping, figured out that when Thomas said it's Justine, he didn't mean like, I need you to go protect Justine. He meant the bad guy that is driving all of this is Justine, who is Thomas's girlfriend who is pregnant. So that was the thing also that where he was saying, like, why didn't this god just attack us he gave us time to do this and whatever he goes that's really weird there must be a puppeteer to this like why would this god just like roll in out of nowhere she has like a, a, a throne under the sea or whatever like why would she roll up here and decide like now's the time like that seems dumb right and then there was also an attack on the outer gates and and like while that made sense generally it didn't because like the only person it sidelined at all was the lenanchi and i guess uh Rashid couldn't come to this battle because of it, but that was it, right? He doesn't show up for anything anyway. So um, it didn't really sideline any characters. So while they used it as a distraction or they called it a, a distraction, it didn't really actually distract anyone because um, you don't need the Lenanchi if you have Mab, like frankly, <laughs> right? So he realizes, oh, there's a, this is just, this is a preamble, right? And in some ways it is. It's a preamble to his trilogy later. Um, so, and they've been alluding to this thing called um, Nemesis for a while. And so, uh, yeah, he's on this boat with Justine and he realizes because he's sleeping while on a boat, which is on water, which grounds his magic, that the, the actual enemy is on this boat with him. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and she's been taken over and she's the one that forced Thomas to go try to kill the bad guy. Uh, or she's the one that forced Thomas to go try and assassinate that, um, you know, head of nation and which got him put in jail, which I don't understand. Like, what was the point of that? Like, why would you care if this Svaltar, I can't even say their names. How do you say it? Um, let me Svaltoff? go off. No. I have it written down so that I can make sure that I say it correctly. One second, one second. It's in here somewhere. It is Svartolf. Oh, yeah. Here's Svartolf. Nef Here's nef <laughs> so, <laughs> so why would he even, like, five minutes after the Accords kick in for these peace talks, why would he try to go assassinate some some head of state who he's actually friends with and he's been humping some of the like heads of state's family members this whole time. Like it, it, the attack on that head of state seemed really weird the entire time. Nobody understood. And it turned out that Justine, but being controlled by this entity uh, sent Thomas to do this and that got him sidelined. And I think it was supposed to sideline Harry through the entire, like it was, it was, it was designed to take him out of the battle. So he would spend his time dealing with Thomas, but that's not what ended up happening. I did find it really weird that we didn't get as much of Harry's kind of usual, I don't know, I'm a private eye detective investigating action regarding Thomas throughout literally two books. Yeah. It, it was like, okay, here's the problem presented in like chapter three or four or whatever yeah. of the first book and then the very very end he's like oh figured it out yeah like well knocked out that's, it's a little weird yeah but uh, then again i would say it's not necessarily out of character for uh jim butcher's writing style i feel like sometimes harry does just kind of realize the solution to a problem i mean i do that yeah it's fair i don't know i I'm surprised that he didn't spend more time in the middle of the the two books being like, why the heck did Thomas do the thing? Yep. 
I mean, I think, I think it would seem like maybe kind of too obvious because like, why would Thomas do that? Like he says it once or twice. He goes, why would he do that? Like, that seems dumb. Like he was humping this guy's sister, literally like days beforehand. Like there's no, there's no reason for Thomas not to be a friendly of this guy. And Thomas was well regarded by them. And this seems completely out of character. Like he says all those things. And then I think what happened was because this takes over place over one day, he has to go fight a war essentially. And that's that he, he put Thomas in the hole and left him there. And that's the end of that for right now. Yeah. I Which so. I guess is the same reason why he doesn't talk about Bonnie. Yeah. After we, in, after he introduces her. Yeah. Like he's just real busy. Yeah. Yeah, he is real busy. I'll give him that. Like, I am freaking exhausted. Like, I'm, I am re- I finished reading this, like, what, two days ago? Three days ago? I'm still tired. Like, <laughs> like wow. I didn't even do any of this stuff, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> oh, it was a lot. Oh, goodness. Let's go back to the Christmas story. Okay. That was, that was cute. It made me happy. I appreciate the... It was super cheesy in almost, like, a fan fiction kind of way. Yeah. But I'm here for it. Yeah. I'm down. Mab's gift made me so happy (laughs) and made me laugh so much. They've established before that she tries to kind of like be up to date at least a little bit on what mortals are into. Uh, And she does that via, well, previously she did that via the person who's now the summer lady. No, this happened that way too because Harry asked Molly, like, was that you? And she goes, no, that was Sarissa. Um, so I mean, but then again, like this this whole timeline. Wait, when did Frozen come out? Oh, Frozen came out a long, long time ago. It feels like, like two years ago. I'm no, sure no. it wasn't. I'm Frozen sure it was Frozen Two was two years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. What is time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's so cute. He gives her a frozen gift. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love how Harry's like, is this gonna make her have the ability to like freeze men's hearts to stone and kill them all? And she's like yeah. Wasn't that in the movie? I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's what the character had. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so cute. Yeah. Uh, I I appreciate the little, like, I'm going to put a side story at the end. And I almost wish that more books did that. I yeah. feel like it's not unusual to run across series that have short stories published within other publications um whether that's kind of like jim butcher did where it's a a novel that contains several short stories from several different authors maybe on a theme um like he he has definitely done um and i i feel like i've seen other authors do the same but i don't know i kind of wish that more of them would include them as part of the story yeah whether in at the end kind of like this it was so nice to have a really sweet fluffy (laughs) little story at the end yeah i think also these stories were really relevant to the story we just read like the the ending the the story that they tacked on was really relevant to the the story that we just read because it like gave he he demanded them give receipts and that's what he got from molly was the receipts for help helping all the people who were uh involved slash lost people in it so Uh, you know speaking of which is <laughs> can you tell the story was written in uh America? Yeah. Because a huge like plot point I don't know how to say plot point. Uh, point of contention perhaps near the end is Harry advocating for all of these people who were injured and died during the course of this battle. He says, "Hey, supernatural folks, you fucked up. You involved hundreds and thousands and thousands of mortal lives you need to pay for their health care yep that was needed from this battle and pay for all of their funeral costs and things like that like he got reparations oh and that's i mean that's a that is a thing in the accords like they do they've talked about wear guilds before but like yeah yeah they he you can tell it was written here and now like yeah. for sure because of that which i mean good jim butcher has gone out of his way to put stuff in the books that lets his political views be known like he had um that garden where men would go meet up with other men and titania asked him how he felt about that and he goes as long as they're not hurting me i don't care you know like he slides stuff in that is his political opinion about stuff like that 
a lot, actually. So, you know, it's not completely out of character for him to do it for that for that also. Shall we move on to ratings and stuff? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. So if you had to give this a rating, what would you give it? Oh, my goodness. So I'm going to have to preamble that much like this podcast for this this pair of books, I'm not going to rate it as one book. Or not rate it as two books. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Because I feel like it would perform a little bit poorly as two books. I'm going to continue with my my uh stance earlier that it should be one book that was maybe edited down a little bit further to kind of fit what they needed it to but if this were one giant ass book gosh i mean 4.5 5 like it's real high up there on its uh you know stars and stones <laughs> category <laughs> it's i especially after getting the whole story part one and part two it's really good i really enjoyed it including the christmas story if the christmas story is included in the uh like written then i feel like that does take away something yeah i kind of wonder about that too i guess we should find out if that's in the audio or the regular book or not so yeah what would you rate it um if i had to read it as single books I would rate Peace Talks at a four and Battleground at a 4.8. Okay. So, because I think I'm a person who likes completion slash closure and Peace Talks like ends in a place where you're just like, damn it. Like you could see the to be continued written on the black screen. That yeah. was real annoying. And I hate that. Absolutely part one of a part two episode. If I had to read them together, I would rate them together as probably a 4.9. Like I liked this book a lot. Like I said, yeah. I'm friggin' exhausted from it. The like minor editing stuff that happened in Peace Talks was annoying to me. There was some some little things about it that I didn't like, which is why it doesn't get a five stars. But like I don't rate books this high very often. I rate I rate most books pretty well, but like it's pretty hard to get that high of a rating. But I yeah. at, out of the series, this is one of my favorite books, like for sure. It's interesting trying to think about this the way I might if it were a single book, right? Because I can't. I literally can't erase the the past two months of rereading or several years ago my first time reading through the story there's no way for me to cleanly give a reader a sense of what it might be to listen to this book or a pair of books on their own you can't right? I, mean, I mean don't don't yeah, don't do it <laughs> don't skip to the end of a series don't. and maybe the reason that it's so easy to rate it highly is because i'm familiar with the series and i i recognize and i'm sorry if anybody out there is a little bit frustrated with our kind of feelings on various books throughout this whole podcast it's it's easy to fall in love with characters when you've gotten the chance to read their whole series yeah and it's harder when you've only read the first book yeah so dresden files may have an unfair advantage but i kind of don't care yeah i i fully agree with that like i don't don't try to read these <laughs> without reading the series and do read this like what would you give the series as a rating i would say a solid four okay i don't know like i feel like this book reveals a lot and it does a lot of really interesting things with the series but series on a whole four solid yeah that's good i'm down okay i i give it a way higher score like i give it a like it is my second favorite book series ever so i mean i'm way up in the like 4.7 4.8 range because i I like it brandon sanderson has my heart you Mm -hmm. you. (laughs) there are people who um have mentioned things to me about about these books that they really don't like they they think they're really misogynistic and they they don't like the way harry talks and whatever and i'm like okay like i get it I get why you say that, and also it doesn't yep. bother me. Doesn't bother me at all. So that's cool. Yeah. I can completely understand why someone might not enjoy the series for that reason. Yeah, I, I can completely see it. Yeah. I'm not blind to it. Yeah. Um, 
I think that there there may be a sense the same way that I get a little bit um, used to the way that Jim Butcher will repeat the same. Let mm-hmm. me explain this thing for the seventeenth time, but not everything else. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get uh, maybe I just kind of get used to it. Yep, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I listened to the this series over again with the the ear for is it super misogynistic, and I'm like, oh no. The women in this book are more powerful than any of the men are at all. And they they have they are the dominant species in this book. <laughs> Let me just say that. So Harry is constantly baffled by the women in this book. So no, I don't think it is super misogynistic. I did really appreciate that in neither of these two books, at least that I can recall, did he do that thing that Jim Butcher slash Harry Dresden does where he says like, well, I just can't help it. I'm a little bit of a chauvinist pig. I have to protect the women. Yep. I like, think- that is a line. Like, almost word for fucking word. Yeah, yeah. That he says several times throughout the series. And I, I can appreciate that he didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. That was good. <sighs> Sigh. Also, yeah, I think people forget like when these books are written. Like, he started writing this series like 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, he started writing really strong women characters. Yeah, he opens doors for them. Let it go. Give him credit for 20 years ago. He was kind of ahead of his curve, actually. You know, yeah. like, don't judge 20 years ago books by today's standards. That's not fair, right? Have you ever, uh, like, rewatched an old TV series that you remember watching when you were younger and going, oh, oh, oh this yeah. did not age well? yeah. Yeah, or like watching the Cosby show. (laughs) All Uh, right. Is this book worth a reread? I mean, clearly, yes, given that I have, uh, I've reread it, I guess, twice now. Yeah. And you've reread it, what, 10? Well, 10 times up to Peace Talks. No, that's not true. So here's the thing is like, I've reread the whole series, not 10 times. I, Every time I get the bo- a new book, I read the book, and then I read the whole series again. So it is my 10th time through, but when I started this series, there was already eight books in it. So I read all of those, and then I read them all again when the ninth book came out, and then I read them all again when the 10th book came out. So not every book has been read- reread 10 times, so I guess that's not really yeah. fair to say. I, I get but you. Yeah. That, I feel like people 100% did the same thing for the Harry Potter series. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like they would reread everything up to that point. And that's only seven books. So Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it's worth a reread and I probably will continue to reread it. Um, Although I was thinking about it and like, I probably don't need to read the first like eight books. I could just start somewhere where I know where it is. Like where there's a point at which... um the winter mother takes Harry to the outer gates and shows yeah. him what Mab is. And mm-hmm. that is a pivotal point to me in my head about how, when one of the places where the series like just takes a left turn and like the world opens up and all kinds of different things have different meanings. So I think I could start at that point from now on if I wanted to. All right. Would you recommend this book to a friend? <laughs> well, not this book or this pair of books. I recommend you start from the beginning. Uh, I realize this is an again kind of an unusual stance for uh, for our books. Usually, we we talk about the first book in a series. Mm-hmm. I I would still recommend the Dresden series if you're into the concept of urban fantasy. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I would obviously recommend this book to a friend, um, especially if you're into urban fantasy, but I would recommend it to basically anybody. Um, I, you know, there's stuff in it that I think is stressful. So maybe not someone who is super delicate, but other than that, yeah, for sure. All right. Are you ready for speed round? Go for it. All right. If this book had a theme song, what would its theme song be? Now... (laughs) This is so unrelevant, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, Earlier today, I was trying to test out a lyric site with my partner. Uh And we were trying to think of a song to like enter in to test whether or not it was correctly bringing up lyrics like it should. Yep. 
<laughs> so he put in Lady Gaga's romance, bad romance. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh and oh poor poor Harry. I feel like his series of life his life is a series of bad romances. Yep. Oh my goodness. I don't know that that's necessarily battleground relevant. Oh, although maybe it is relevant for poor uh, Thomas and his relationship with Justine and whatever the heck's going on with that right now. You also, Oof. oh yeah, you also find out he's known about this for a long time. Oh, I, I didn't catch that. Yeah. She, I, he, when did he talk to just or uh, uh, to uh, Thomas? He didn't. When he talked to Justine, he said, "How long have you been in there?" Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. He tells him that she he knew right away. Oh, yeah. So he he knew, and he hasn't told Harry either. That's another. Hmm. Okay, we're still mm-hmm. talking about the book. <laughs> <laughs> if this book were a food what food would it be flame and hot cheetos okay i feel <laughs> that, that good good uh spice i i feel like it is it is predominantly battle especially the the whole second book yeah it's it's, it's literally battlegrounds it's nothing but battle nothing but fighting and characters dying and proving their worth and you know, grit and valor and like <laughs> rage, of, rage of dragons flashbacks. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> like, so I feel like something very spicy is appropriate. Okay. Um, if this book were a candy bar, what candy bar would it be? God damn it, you with the food. Um, <laughs> I have another one. Do you want a different one? No, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take candy bar. I just, I just have to think about it i feel like one of those candy bars that has the um it pops does that make sense like mm-hmm. sometimes there's ones where there's if you introduce moisture to the candy mm-hmm. it does like little snaps like pop rocks off. yes but like in the candy bar yep. mm-hmm. and chili peppers because i'm gonna i'm gonna keep with that uh it needs to be spicy i'm surprised you didn't choose a theme song by the red hot chili peppers i had I know the band. I can't think of any songs. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. Under the Bridge was like the Boulevard of Broken Dreams of like 10 years solid. They still play it on the radio too much. Well, I recognize Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Yeah. Because they play it on the radio too much. Fair enough. (laughs) If you could change anything about this book, what would it be? I feel like there were fight scenes that could have been shortened. Yep. Like down to bare mentions. Yep. Um, and that was the thing about, you know, when you have a 17 hours of a book and gosh, you know, over 10 hours of it is literally nothing but fight scenes. Yep. I was tuning it out. Rage of Dragons flashbacks. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I, I feel like you could totally take a lot of these fight scenes and say, you know, oh, as I was running through to this other street, I saw name a character do this crazy thing. Oh my goodness. And like, and then he kept going. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of devoting an entire scene to it. For sure. All right. Three words to describe this book. Every oh. time, you know, I'm going to ask this question and you don't know. <laughs> and every time I don't think about it. <laughs> um, oh my God. I, I hate to use a word that's in the title of the thing. Let's go with war. I was going to yep. say battle, but let's go with war. Because yep. it is. It is a war between a huge group of peoples and, you know, someone who's trying to invade them and say that they're wrong and they're terrible and they're the worst. Yep. Um, I would say love. Yep. In, in that way that, like, hate and love are sometimes talked about as both opposites, but also not. They talk about it in this book. Yeah. Like, yeah. There, there's... It's relevant like the the in incredible passion and love that you have for some people invites the actions that you take for or against them yep and lastly family yeah which might be similar to that that love thing but s- similar but different i feel like so much of harry's driving force his you know reason for doing what he does is because of his family whether it's literal bloodline family or chosen family you know the people that you have decided are your best friends in the world that deserve your protection and devotion and love and 
that's what he does, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, Morgan. Yes. What are we reading next? Next up, we are listening to Sandman. This is so fun. I read the comic book series forever ago. So did I. It's it's one of the first comic book series that I ever read. It's delightfully dark and it's fascinating fucking weird. and absolutely weird. <laughs> there like there's nothing about this series that is normal or yep. reasonable. It's such an interesting interpretation of the concept of gods and dreams and human subconscious and it's so fascinating which i'm really excited by uh so this is by neil gaiman and just kind of as a quick fyi this series is not not for kids not for youngins it's it's got mature concepts not only in the concept of oh there's hanky panky or oh there's violence but like it's freaking weird in yeah. mind bending bizarre ways or at yep. least the comic was so i presume that the audiobook version of that same story will be the audiobook has a warning on it that says just like the original graphic novels this audio adaptation contains explicit language and graphic violence as well as strong sexual content and themes discretion is advised just fyi it's not so weird that like you can't read it but if you're sensitive or whatever i mean i wouldn't let your 10 year old read it or listen to this or whatever you know like i mean i would have read it at 10 but yeah and ignoring the fact that i think i literally started the comic book series when i was 10 but you know whatever but some parents are like nope and this is for sure the case with this one yeah um there is an interesting cast like neil gaiman is is actually a reader in this same james mcavoy is in it uh andy circus michael sheen taryn edgerton kat dennings a bunch of people are in this as a full cast performance so it should be pretty bomb i am so excited Ah. yeah and just for people who maybe aren't going to listen to this if you wanted to you could read the first um comics this uh adapts volumes one through three of the graphic novel series is which is includes Preludes and Nocturnes, The Doll's House, and Dream Country, which are very strange. The, doll, uh, do, the Doll's House is a really weird one. So you could read the comic instead of this and still catch up with this podcast if you want to. Or if you don't want to listen to this or don't have access to Audible for audiobooks, um, you can still just listen to this podcast and hear we'll what tell we think you about, about it. it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure you'll get all the spoilers, so it'll be fine. I'm just, I'm probably just going to be sitting there for an hour going, this is friggin' weird. Uh, I'm <laughs> so excited. I, I haven't started listening yet, but I am so here for it. Yeah, Neil Gaiman is hands down one of my favorite authors. I literally own every book he's ever published. There's only one I don't like, which is the one that he got the most awards for, which is American Gods. I was not into that, although I was into the TV show. Oh. Um, I've met him, I think, upwards of 20 times. I have this recursive picture project with him where I had him sign my ipod one time and he signed it and drew dream from the sandman on on my ipod and i took a picture and then the next time i brought him that picture and he signed it and he was like hey. and then the next time i brought him a picture of him signing that picture <laughs> and i've been doing that every time i see him he used to come to the bay area a lot like i mean there was one year when he came like i think five times so he started recognizing me after a while which was kind of funny because he was like oh you got a picture cool um so yeah, so I have this recursive picture project going on with him. I gotta find those. I don't know where they are. If I find them, I'll I'll post them on our Instagram at That'd some be point. So cool. I don't know where they are. Maybe I haven't I can find- met like any star people at all. Oh, Comic Con was really helpful. Also, people come to the Bay Area. I am a person who somehow finds out about these things and then makes sure I go to them. Like I used to go to like nine to ten events a week. Oh. Like I would go to concerts, I would go to readings, I would go to whatever. I, I don't mind crowds. I'm How super extrovert. Extrovert. No. Extrovert. No. Just just extrovert. Yeah, that's all you have to do. Just extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't mind that stuff. Um, so and I'm I'm kinda into it. So I go to a lot of events and stuff. Well, I did previously. This is this is one of the reasons Corona sucks for me, because I'm just like, I guess I'm in my house now. Yep. So instead, I just started like an extra YouTube channel and, you know, a podcast. A podcast. It's, fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. All right. Anything else we have about our next book? 
Um, I think that's about it. Um, I do have homework for everyone, which is the three items that I always ask you to do, which is rating this book on your purchase platform. If you read Peace Talks and or Battleground, please go to your purchase platform and rate that book. It really helps the authors out. Go ahead and rate this podcast on whatever podcast app you like to subscribe on and follow us on Instagram at ladies who genre, all one word. So